हेलो स्टूडेंट्स टुडे विल डिस्कस अबाउट द शोल्डर जॉइंट बिफोर गोइंग टू द शोल्डर जॉइंट यू शुड हैव द आइडिया अबाउट द डिफरेंस बिटवीन द शोल्डर जॉइंट एंड शोल्डर गर्डल इट्स अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन फॉर योर एग्जाम दैट हाउ विल यू डिफरेंशिएट द गर्डल एंड द जॉइंट सो डियर स्टूडेंट्स द शोल्डर गर्डल इज ऑल्सो नोन इज पैक्टोरल गर्डल एंड द अनदर इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग इज दैट दिस पैक्टोरल गर्डल connects the bone of upper limb with the axial skeleton so here the important word is axial skeleton now in this image you can see that axial skeleton means this axial skeleton which is midline is area and this is your upper limb now the connection between this is your pectoral girdle so what bones consist of this area so it is clavicle and scapula so clavicle and scapula both are responsible to connect the upper limb with the midline axial skeleton and this is here you can see that this is the clavicle this is the scapula and what are the joints of these bones so one is the sternoclavicular joint so this is the sternoclavicular joint and then acromioclavicular joint so this is a joint here so my dear students the at the end what is the important thing about the pectoral girdle that pectoral girdle is responsible for connection of the upper limb with the axial skeleton with the help of two bones clavicle and scapula and there is a two joint one is sterno clavicular joint one is acromio clavicular joint now this girdle permits the movement of clavicle and scapula like you will have the protraction of the scapula you will have the retraction of the scapula when you will have the overhead abduction you will have a rotation of the clavicle all these movements of the girdle is actually the movement of your clavicle and scapula now when we will talk about the shoulder joint the shoulder joint is a articulation between the head of humerus and the scapula and you know that there is a glenoid cavity and this glenoid cavity is the area where you will have the formation of shoulder joint with the scapula so the humerus is not part of your girdle the girdle is actually formed by the clavicle and scapula whenever we are talking about the humerus and the scapula we always talk about the shoulder joint so the movement at the joint shoulder joint are different like flexion extension abduction adduction but the movement of the shoulder girdle are different like your elevation depression protraction retraction forward and backward rotation of the scapula so dear students this part of the slide has to be very clear in your mind that what is the difference between the girdle and the joint and that's why the movements of the girdle and joints are also different so let's discuss the shoulder joint now when you will see the shoulder joint you have to write down the joint in these subheadings that is what is the type of the shoulder joint is what are the articular surfaces ligaments of the joint that means we will see mainly the capsule of the joint and other supporting ligament then you will have bursa now you know that bursas are actually the sponges of the sinus membrane contains the sinus fluid to prevent the friction between adjacent structures then we'll talk about the relation blood supply nerve supply movements and clinical anatomy in this video i will talk about the type and articular surfaces in the second video of the shoulder joint we'll talk about the ligaments and the bursa of the shoulder joint and in the third part we'll discuss about the remaining areas of the shoulder joint so first what is the type of the shoulder joint is the shoulder joint is a synovial variety and in the synovial variety it is a ball and socket type of the joint and when you will have the ball and socket you will know that ball socket joints are highly movable joint and they are known as diarthrosis joint so it's a freely movable and the freedom of the movement is in all the three degree that means you can move the upper limb in x y and z in all the three uh, dimensions and it is a multi axial type of joint clear now the important thing comes about the shoulder joint is that 
when we'll compare the hip joint and the shoulder joint, we'll realize that the hip joint is more stronger as compared to the shoulder joint. So the question comes is that why the shoulder joint is weak? It is functionally weak so that it allow the free movement of your humerus and the glenoid cavity. So the reason of the weakness is that you know that the joint is formed by the articulation of the glenoid cavity of the scapula with the head of humerus. And the important thing comes is that if you will see the uh, comparison between the size of the head and the articular surface that is of the glenoid cavity, it is in the ratio of 1 is to 4. That means the head of humerus is 4 times larger than this surface of the glenoid cavity. So here you can see that the areas which are articulating with each other are not of the equal size. So because of this reason, it is the one of the most common reason that this joint is weak. So this joint is also known as glenohumeral joint because there is articulation between the glenoid cavity and the head of humerus. Structurally, it is a weak joint because the head of humerus is disproportionately larger. So how many disproportion is there? It is four times larger than the glenoid surface. And the head, that's why allow, you know, this uh, joint is allow the great mobility. The great mobility is there because the head is not restricted by the glenoid cavity. Glenoid cavity is smaller, so the head can rotate in any direction in any axis. So for this reason, to allow the maximum uh, move mobility, you have very smaller size of your glenoid cavity. So the ball is represented by the spheroidal head of the humerus, which is around one third of a sphere. Now the direction, now when you will see the articular surfaces, the direction, the head is directed medially upward and backward. Now see, this is the view which you are able to see in this position. Now here you can see that this is your head of the humerus on both the joints. Now this head, now when you will see, this head is directed medially. This head is not directed exactly towards the midline, but it is having a little bit backward component. Now here you can see that this head is directed backward. So when you are holding the humerus in anatomical position, you have to keep this thing in mind that the head of humerus is not exactly directing mid towards the midline. It is directing towards the midline, but a little bit backward component is always there. Why? Because if you will see the reciprocal surface, this reciprocal surface that is the glenoid cavity is not exactly facing laterally. Now this is not exactly facing laterally, it is facing forward. So that's why the head of humerus is not exactly facing medially, it is having medially and backward component. And in this way, this alignment will be there, clear? So for this alignment, that means this glenoid cavity and head of humerus should come in one line. Your head is not exactly medially, it is medially but backward because the glenoid cavity is not exactly laterally, it is laterally but in forward direction, clear? Now when you will see the head of humerus, it is covered by the hyaline cartilage and you know that it is an articular cartilage and this hyaline cartilage thickest in the center and it is thinner at the periphery of the your bone, head of the humerus, clear? Now the socket, now what is the socket? Socket is formed by the glenoid cavity which is a, which is a pear shape. Now here you can see that it is a pear shape socket and it is the glenoid cavity. Now it is a shallow, you know that it is one fourth as compared to the size of the head of humerus and here you have the word it is laterally upward and forward. So it is directed forward and head of the humerus directed medially and backward and it is directed laterally and forward, clear? So my dear students, these are the very important questions for your exam that when you are holding the scapula, this scapula is not exactly facing laterally. It is something 
where you will have the glenoid cavities facing forward and laterally. And reciprocally, the head of humerus is medially but little bit backward, so the scapula and humerus will come in a alignment. Now, only one third of the humerus had come in contact with the glenoid cavity. The narrow upper end of the glenoid cavity encroaches on the root of the cricoid process. Now, here you can see that this is the narrowest part of the glenoid cavity from where there is a origin of your coracoid process. Now, near this origin, you will have a elevation and this is known as supraglenoid tubercle, which provide intracapsular origin of the long head of biceps brachii. So, dear students, this is a very important question. Write down the example of intracapsular origin of the muscle. Answer is long head of biceps brachii. That means the origin is not visible in the dissection without cutting the capsule of shoulder joint. The anterior margin of glenoid cavity. Now see, on the anterior side, you will have a, this notch. Now on this anterior side, this notch is produced by a tendon of the muscle which is present here on the ventral surface of the scapula that is known as subscapularis. So this tendon of subscapularis is responsible for the notch on the anterior margin of glenoid cavity. This fossa is also covered by the articular cartilage that is again the high line but this cartilage is having a thin area in the center. If you will remember, I told you that articular cartilage which is covering the head of humerus is having thick area in the center. Here it is thin in the center and it is thick at the periphery. The glenoid fossa is deepened by a fibrocartilaginous ring. Now this is again the question of your exam that articular cartilage is hyaline type but on the margin of glenoid cavity, you will have a ring. Now this ring is known as labrum. What is that? It is known as labrum of glenoid cavity or it is known as glenoid labrum. And this labrum is made up of which cartilage? Answer is fibrocartilage. So dear students, in this slide you will have the two very important question. What is the reason of the notch on the anterior margin? Answer is tendon of subscapularis. And second question is why there is a presence of a glenoid labrum. So this glenoid labrum is a fibrocartilaginous ring and it helps to deepen the surface. What is the function of this ring? It deepens the socket or the glenoid cavity for the well accommodation of the head of humerus. So the joint become closed pack. Now see this is again a question of your exam. What is the closed pack position of your shoulder joint? So for the closed pack, that means when there is a maximum articulation or you can say maximum contact between the two bones is known as closed pack condition. So when you will have the closed pack condition of your shoulder joint, when there is a maximum contact of the head of humerus with the glenoid cavity, it is when your upper limb is abducted and laterally rotated. That means when I am doing the abduction and when there is a lateral rotation. So in this situation, when you will have the abducted and laterally rotated upper hand, at that time there is a maximum contact between the head of humerus and your glenoid cavity. So this is known as closed pack position of your this joint, clear? Now here in this two images, first you can appreciate that this is the origin of subscapularis and this subscapularis is creating here the depression or the notch on the anterior border and here you can see that this is the intra-articular origin of the long head of the biceps. So these are the two very important questions for your exam. Clear? Now we will come to the one more very important point which has been so many times asked in your exam. What are the factors responsible for the stability of your shoulder joint? So when we are talking about the dislocation of the shoulder joint, you have to understand that the dislocation of the shoulder joint is more frequent as compared to the hip joint. The reason is because it is weak joint. Why it is weak? 
बिकॉज देर इज ए हाईली डिसप्रपोर्शनेट सरफेस एरिया बट दो देर इज ए डिसप्रपोर्शन देर आर मल्टीपल फैक्टर्स विच अवॉइड द डिसलोकेशन ऑफ दिस जॉइंट सो वॉट आर द फैक्टर्स द फर्स्ट फैक्टर इज दैट सुपीरियरली दिस जॉइंट इज सपोर्टेड बाय मैनी स्ट्रक्चर्स सो डियर स्टूडेंट्स यू हैव टू कीप दिस थिंग इन माइंड दैट द शोल्डर जॉइंट इज हैविंग द सपोर्ट ऑन द सुपीरियर आस्पेक्ट एंटीरियर आस्पेक्ट एंड पोस्टीरियर आस्पेक्ट but inferiorly it is having very less support that's why the inferior part of the shoulder joint is known as weakest area so this you have to keep in mind always sometimes you have this question uh, this question may be asked in your exam that which area of the shoulder joint is weak so the inferior aspect of the shoulder joint is weak because it is having a minimal support there so what are the supports superiorly now superiorly you will have a important structure is known as coraco acromial arch now you know that there are two process of the scapula coracoid process and acromial process now between the coracoid process and acromial process you can see this green color band now this band is known as coraco acromial ligament what is the name of the band coraco acromial ligament and all these three named as a coraco acromial arch so coraco acromial arch is formed by the three structure coracoid process coraco acromial ligament and the inferior surface of acromial process and all these three are known as or going to form the secondary socket for the head of humerus that means this articular surface which is here it can be you can use this area also and this area is used only when we are doing overhead abduction so when we are doing the overhead abduction in those movement this dead space utilized by the head of the humerus that's why this area is known as secondary socket for the head of humerus but here you can see that you cannot have the upward dislocation of the joint why because in the upper part it is supported by the two bony process and there is a thick connection between these two process which is known as coraco acromial ligament clear then you know the second factor is glenoid labrum glenoid labrum i just told you it is a ring of the fibrocartilage which surround the margin of the glenoid cavity and it deepens the glenoid cavity the third is musculo tendinous cuff now my dear student this is a very important factor for the stabilize stabilizer of your shoulder joint because there are four tendons and one tendon is coming anteriorly superiorly and inferior posteriorly so these tendons are cov covering the shoulder joint in three sides so there are three sides so anteriorly you will have a tendon is known as subscapularis then you will have superiorly a tendon is known as supraspinatus and posteriorly it is supported by infraspinatus and teres minor so these four tendons are supporting this joint in three sides anteriorly superiorly and posteriorly so that's why this musculo tendinous cuff or rotator cuff is termed as a guardian of shoulder joint so this is a one line question for your exam what is guardian of shoulder joint answer is rotator cuff so in this video clip you can appreciate the musculo tendinous cuff now this is the lateral view where you can see that this is your lesser tubercle this is your greater tubercle on the lesser tubercle from anterior side you will have the muscle is subscapularis from the superior side you can see the muscle is coming the supraspinatus and when you will go posteriorly on the greater tubercle you will find the two more muscle one is your infraspinatus and the teres minor so here you can see that this is infraspinatus and teres minor so in this way you can see the two muscles are posteriorly one muscle superiorly and one muscle anteriorly so all these four muscles are known as the component of rotator cuff and they are supporting the joint in three areas clear now what is the other factor for the stability 
The other factor which provide the stability is a connection of your humerus with scapula. That means the muscles those are holding the humerus, the muscles those are holding the humerus with pectoral girdle and these muscles are supraspinatus. Now supraspinatus you know that it comes from the scapula going on the humerus and this supraspinatus along with the long head of the biceps, brachii and deltoid. Now see there are three muscles those are connecting the scapula and humerus. One is supraspinatus which comes from the superior side. Then you will have the long head of the biceps which is coming again from the scapula going connecting this going towards the humerus and you will have a deltoid that will come here. Now these muscles are responsible to hold the humerus towards the glenoid cavity. So they are keeping this humerus to remain towards the scapula. So they are one of the very important factors in uh, stabilizing the joint. Then there is a long head of the triceps. Now this is the important structure which hold or support the joint inferiorly. Now here this is the infraglenoid tubercle where you will have the origin of your triceps long head. But my dear students this line is having a word is abduction. That means when you are doing the abduction of the joint. Now when I am keeping this joint, this head of the humerus away. Now I need something which keep this head pulled towards the uh, glenoid cavity to avoid the dislocation. And that is the function of the long head of the triceps. In abduction it supports the joint inferiorly. Because when you are doing the abduction, now this head of the triceps that is coming from the infraglenoid tubercle is remain contracted and this contraction keeping the head to remain uh, in uh, your glenoid cavity. It prevents the dislocation. So if I will cut this long head of the triceps what will happen that the head will dislocate if you will do the abduction. Clear? Then you will have coracohumeral ligament. Now see the name is that it is a connection between the coracoid process and the humerus. Now this is a coracohumeral ligament which is again providing the support from the superior side and the atmospheric pressure which also stabilizes the joint. Now in this image you can see that this is your coracohumeral ligament. Now if you see this coracohumeral ligament, this coracohumeral ligament attached on the lesser as well as the upper part of greater tubercle along with the anatomical line. Now this is the area of your anatomical neck. So along this anatomical neck you will have the attachment of this coracohumeral which is coming from the coracoid process and going towards the this upper part of tubercles. Clear? Now this is again a very important question for your exam that what is the role of atmospheric pressure in the stabilizing the joint? Or somebody may ask you that how the atmospheric pressure comes in picture to stabilize the, your shoulder joint. Now my dear students, I will tell you the one thing very clearly that atmospheric pressure is actually not directly stabilizing the joint. But if the pressure inside the shoulder joint become equivalent to the atmospheric pressure, it will lead to the uh, this uh, subluxation of the shoulder joint. So the joint become unstable if the pressure inside the shoulder joint cavity become equivalent to the atmospheric pressure. So the atmospheric pressure stabilizes the joint only in the way that the pressure outside the joint is high and pressure inside the joint cavity is negative. But if that negative pressure is become equivalent to the atmospheric pressure, your joint is become unstable how let's discuss this so the normal pressure inside the joint cavity is negative so this is the first thing which you always keep in mind that in this joint cavity when you will have this cavity the pressure is inside the cavity is always negative so here the pressure is negative clear now this negative intra articular pressure 
is important for motor coordination. Now motor coordination means that there are pressure receptors present in the joint and these pressure receptor inside the shoulder joint are responsible for the coordinating movement of the muscles which are surrounding the joint and that's why it is helpful to work against the dislocating factors and it provide the stabilizing the shoulder joint. Clear? So this is the first and important concept that the negative intraarticular pressure is responsible to work all the muscles around the joint to stabilize the shoulder joint. Clear? But if, now suppose this is your capsule. Clear? And we know that the pressure is negative. But if there is a change in intraarticular pressure, that means Suppose there is an injury in this glenoid labrum. Now, if there is an injury in the glenoid labrum, which is known as Bankert's lesion, now what will happen? There is a kind of leakage occurs in the joint. Now, once the leakage or the puncture occurs in the joint cavity, what will happen? This pressure is not remain negative. It is now, it, will, it is going to suck the atmospheric air inside. So now the pressure has been changed inside. It is not no more negative. So in such condition, what will happen that the joint is become unstable. Why? The absence of the negative intraarticular pressure disturb the joint mechanics, mechanics and it alters, alters the pressure receptors. I already told you that pressure receptors are having very important role in the coordinating movement of the muscles around the joint. So once the pressure receptor altered, what will happen? That there is a disturbance in the mechanics of the joint and it might disturb the motor coordination that dynamically protect the joint against the dislocating factor. And in such condition, what will happen when the atmospheric pressure enters inside the joint cavity, the joint is become unstable and it will lead to the subluxation of the joint. Clear? So my dear students, if you have this question in exam that how the atmospheric pressure have a role in the stability of the shoulder joint. You have to understand this concept that the atmospheric pressure is harmful for the joint. So you have to understand that the normal pressure in the shoulder joint is negative, but because of any reason, if the shoulder joint pressure is become equivalent to the atmospheric pressure, there is a difficulty in the movement because there is a disruption in the pressure receptors which are responsible for the this static stabilization or stabilization of the shoulder joint clear so my dear students now at the end of this shoulder joint part one we are able to understand the first and most important thing is why shoulder joint is weak second thing is what are the different factors which are responsible for the strengthening of the shoulder joint, which part of the joint is weak and the most important thing is what is the difference between the shoulder joint and the shoulder girdle. So this is all for the session. Thank you.